Okay, so we're going to begin our work session for the evening of September the 18th, 2018, we being the Iowa City City Council. The first topic on our work session agenda is to consider elevating hourly staff wages to $15 an hour or more within two years. And um, I hope everybody in the room understands that th these are, this is a work session. It's where we try to figure out how we think we need to proceed. We're not taking literally formal action, but we're trying to figure out what, uh, what we want, uh, how we want to proceed. And I also would like to say, before we get into discussing the topic in detail, I want everybody in the room, including people watching on TV, television, to know that right now, the lowest starting wage the city pays its roughly 200 permanent employees is $17 and I think 52 cents. 600 employees, not 200. Oh, what, did I say 200? Yeah, 600. Oh, I'm sorry. My gosh, how did I, I, I meant to, uh, 600 employees. And it's $17.52, right, Jeff? Correct. Yeah, so what we will be talking about tonight is whether to increase the minimum wage for temporary hourly employees to $15 an hour within a two-year period or some variant thereof. We employ, at least uh, according to our original account, something like 370 such workers. Roughly two-thirds of them work in the Parks and Recreation Department and another one-sixth in the public library. And almost all of those temporary hourly employees earn between 10-10 and $15 an hour. Do you want to elaborate in any way? You don't have to, but you yeah, I'll just I'll clarify. Our, yeah. our temporary employees fluctuate quite a bit on the season. So, uh, at the time that you received your information uh, earlier this year it was in January. Those numbers were lower than they are now because it's it's summer. There's a lot more, particularly parks and rec positions, uh, that we have during the summer months. And then as we go into fall and winter, that number will come uh, come back down again. So it's it's really hard to tell you how many temporary employees that we, we have, because that, that's a, uh, a number that's constantly changing throughout the seasons. Okay. All right, so I would invite council members to offer their suggestions or whatever, Jeff. Uh, may I just call, call attention, um, Mayor Throgmorton and uh, Council Member Salee have requested some additional information that uh, we, we pulled together pretty quick. I just want to call your attention, there's a memo at your desk. Um, what this gets at, there was, uh, with the two, uh, the two largest areas where we have temporary employees is the library and the recreation division of our, our parks department. And we had previously supplied you with some uh, total numbers of employees and then the wage scale. Uh, what we tried to do in this memo is, is give you a better sense of where the majority of those employees fall within those wage scales. So if you would like, um, Simon Andrew, who prepared this memo, could, could walk you through that. Or if you've had time to, to read and digest that, we can simply answer questions if they come up. Well, I thought I saw some broad numbers here. So it looked to me like there are 11 out of 52 hourly library employees, 11 earn more than $15 an hour. The others earn 14 or less per hour. And then with regard to parks and rec employees, when this particular memo was prepared, there were 400 part-time employees, is that correct? Or 401. 401 temporary employees. And 73% of them have wages of $12 an hour or less. 24% have wages between $12.50 and $14.50. And 3% have wages of $15 or higher. It's mostly accurate. Um, those 401 employees, actually fill about 1,300 different jobs. So, so for example, you might have a employee at the pool that serves as a manager one night, a swim instructor the next day, and then just a regular lifeguard. Those are all different. They're going to find themselves in, in multiple positions throughout the year. So um, those percentages that you gave reflect the various positions and not the actual employees. You could think of it probably in the same, but just to clarify that. Okay, good deal. 
All right, council members, what are, what are your thoughts here? What did you want? Well, I guess I'll start the ball rolling here. You know, when we last discussed this, uh, which was what, a couple of sessions ago, work sessions ago, <clears throat> I referenced the, um, I'd done a little bit of research on this online and, and found that Madison, Wisconsin had a uh, living wage ordinance where the, the, the wage for their temporary employees was set at 13.27 an hour. And uh, that seemed to correlate fairly well with some of the work that the Iowa Policy Project has done. Um, if you look at their estimates for a living wage for a single adult household, it's right around that same figure. So this, this is a complicated issue, both in the sense of you know, the question of what the living wage should be, and then also, as you know, Jeff had lined out, outlined um, back in, in August, the, the impacts of this on the entire wage structure for the city. So I, I felt, what, what can we, what could I say at this point? And it, it, it boiled down to, in my mind, the, the idea of, of st striving to raise the, the lower uh, thresholds of the, the wages, in other words, the entry level wages, uh, to 1327, while at the same time looking at essentially compressing the wage scales within our temporary classes so that the, the impacts of this would not, um, would have minimal impact on the permanent employees. So we, there would be a significant pay increase at the, you know, in one's first year, of, at least for those classifications or positions which are set at 10 to $11 an hour. Uh, but as you move up, as the longer you stay with the city, the the you know the, the wage increases wouldn't be as dramatic as they are now. So in other words, you know some of the step increases now might be between 50 and 75 cents. That would come down maybe to 25 cents. So so the goal in my mind was to to increase at the bottom, uh, kind of consolidate and compress within the temporaries, and and maintain that kind of you know, gradient that we have now from temporary to full-time employment. Um, in terms of the timeline, I was thinking uh, that we could initiate the 1325 in July of next year. Uh, we could also ask staff, because a lot of this, you know, what, what are the financial impacts of this? That's, you know, the big question. Um, it could be implemented either July of 2019 or July of 2020 with a, a step to 1150 as a minimum wage in in July of 2018. So just just so that we'd understand the financial implications, have have at least a couple of scenarios. What was the step that you said? Might you know, be roughly possible. in between 10 10 and 13.25. So it would be around 11.25, something like that. No, wait, it would be uh, 11.50. Uh, so clearly, you know, that step increase, you know, the, the finan financial impacts would be significantly less if we did it in two years than in one year because uh, many of the positions are already set at 11.50 at an entry level. And then the last thing I would say is the question of there's a one year in a high school intern position, whether what we do applies to that, and I, as I recall with Madison, it does not apply. Uh, so that's a question. If if it's not 1325, I, I felt that position should still see a raise. So right now it's at I think 1027 um, could be raised to 1125 in July of 2019. So everyone, pretty much everyone, will get a raise. Uh, even in, in the, the longer you stay with the city, it won't be quite as dramatic, but even those step increases, we'll see an increase. But you mean like when it should be 13? You mean like July of 2019 is 11.25? That's what you think? I was saying the, to understand, because we don't know what the financial implications of, of this change will be, uh, that I was suggesting we we asked staff to, to look at it both in terms of 1325 in July of 2019 and 1325 July of 2020 with an interim step 
in July of 2019 of 1150. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to add to, I, re I really agree with you, John, but I, I want to add, you, you just mentioned the Iowa policy project. For the, you know, the benefit of the audience or the people who are watching us, they don't have the paper that we have in front of us. I just want to say that, you know, as Jeff said, you know, that the, and the part-time employees or the hourly employees increasing every, maybe during summers more than another time. But if we just say estimating 370 Iowa City part-time employees, which is hourly employees, are paid poverty wage of less than $15 an hour. The Iowa Policy Project estimates that in 2018, a single person in Johnson County would have to earn at least $14.22 an hour to live just their basic need budget. And a single parent with one child would need a minimum of $25 to cover the family must basic needs. Poverty wages really cause a lot of, you know, bad stuff like stress and health consequences and food insecurity and really it is just something bad. We don't want to see it. And I think the city should set the standard high. I, can, I really will love if you can do the 1325 by July of 2019. And even we can break it. Like, I can add another addition things. And instead of, uh, when we say 1325 by July, that increase means like $3 jump. Almost, but if we can do it like July, one dollar fifty, and January of two thousand twenty, another dollar fifty. So we don't have like that three dollar like once time. That's, you know. So, so you're suggesting that we start with what was it thirteen twenty five in July of twenty nineteen, then six months later. Bump it up again. No, oh, oh. do it. Do it like one. Let me ten twenty five one dollar fifty. Like eleven uh, seventy five. Uh, eleven seventy five on July of two thousand nineteen. Well, that's what like I was... in the beginning of the budget. Yeah. Yeah. And in January. Oh, okay. January make it thirteen. That's what I think. If I could maybe jump in here and offer my own views. I think it's very important that we identify what the target is first, what the time frame to get there is, and what the budgetary impact will be. So I think the target for me is $15 an hour. I think we need to make clear that that's what we stand for and that's what our goal is. Um, especially, it is a phrase going around the United States, but I think the history of the labor movement are slogans based upon real working needs. The 40-hour work week, the eight-hour work day, and I think now the new standard is the $15 an hour. And I think it's very important that the public sector set the standard because if we can't do it, how can we possibly expect the private sector to follow along? Um, we, are, we do have the financial capacity to do it. It is something that's feasible. That said, it is a budget, a big budget impact. Um, I would like to see, I don't want to get into the minutia of precise time frames, um, but I would like to see it over the course of three years. Um, I do believe that if we do it over three years and have a goal um, of $15 an hour at the end of three years. We are going to have some significant property tax revenue that is going to come in. It will allow our staff opportunity and the collective bargaining to be able to adjust to that so we don't we avoid some of the wage compression. Um, but that's what I would like to see. And with the first step being July 1st, um, 2019, uh, prospectively after that point. So, um, and then from there, I, I think we would just have to have that budget discussion. But that's what I would like to see. I think that gives us time to adapt it establishes the target, and it also establishes clear guidelines in terms of which direction we'd like to go. Uh, Council Member Thomas, Sully, and Cole have all made in some very good points. Uh, I have given this a, a lot of thought and consideration, and I ask you to be patient with me while I read a statement that I've prepared that includes my uh, comments and concerns. And first of all, with all due respect to my brothers and sisters in organized labor, 
I see you all out there, and to Councilwoman Salee, this proposal came as a surprise to me. Uh, no one had ever brought this to my attention. Uh, there was a concern that city employees were receiving poverty wages uh, to me as a council member uh, or to the council as a whole. And just last year, we as a council made a proclamation supporting the Board of Supervisors' efforts to increase the minimum wage locally. And again, no one raised the issue of city employee salaries. Uh, I have many questions yet uh, regarding this. Most importantly, who is this intended for? And thank you all, um, Simon, Jeff, whoever had made the list uh, of some of those that would be included. But um, so are the, is this referring to part-time employees? Uh, and by that, uh, I'm familiar with a definition of part-time as those who work 20 hours or less. So I'm uh, just wondering uh, uh, what is the definition of part-time for us? Or you know, is, is 20 hours or less or more? Uh, and is this of their own choosing to work part-time? Uh, does this include seasonal employees? I think uh, I've heard the answer to that, that uh, it does include some of those. And are they hourly positions or budgeted positions? Uh, because I've recently heard about some part-time staff members whose hours have been cut back. Uh, and that's concerning to me. I don't like hearing that, that um, someone who's expecting uh, so many hours per week is cut back significantly in the number of hours. So I don't like to hear that, that that's happening. Uh, and I think the question was brought up whether this would include student in interns, because we do have quite a few interns that work for us in various capacities. Uh, do any of these positions require special skills? I haven't heard an answer to that. Are any of these positions off shifts or even weekend shifts? And if so, does the city pay shift diff or weekend diff? I, I don't know the answer to that. And if, if we don't, uh, we should consider doing that or even raising that. Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, and this has kind of been raised already. Do we know for certain the total effect this would have on all of the other salaries? Uh, over the course of the next two to three years, uh, could we follow? I originally was thinking of the Board of Supervisors lead with the same percent rate uh, of increments, um, such as this year, it was increased 17 cents per hour, and follow that same continued progression. Uh, but I, I do uh, like uh, Council Member Thomas's suggestion about the progressions. Uh, on, on that. Um, the, another thing that I would like us to consider is offering incentives, such as uh, a yearly bonus for continuing to work for the city, or perhaps even considering educational assistance for college classes. A lot of cities, I looked into that, a lot of cities uh, nearby and surrounding do offer that tuition assistance, particularly for their part-time folks, so that they can uh, continue their education and go further in their careers. Or even vocational training, we've heard a lot about that from uh, members of the audience and the Council that there is a need for that, for the vocational training. I think that that might be something, because there are cities that offer that also. Uh, we've heard that possibly due to the need to achieve the goals in our strategic plan, the city staff are feeling stressed. And what I would like to see is that we put our efforts towards, I'm sorry, this is long, I told you it's going to be long, towards looking at each of the departments to assess their possible need for additional full-time staff and put financial resources towards that, thus giving additional full-time job opportunities for more people. And one place where there is likely to be a major need for more positions is the transit department. We heard about that earlier, that we're going to be looking at that very soon. So I think it would be imperative that we have sufficient funds in our salary budget to be able to add transit drivers, and that would be quite a cost. Uh, and Councilwoman Salee, uh, you told me about one employee that you know of who struggles to make ends meet, uh, and that, that does concern me. And of course, you have good intentions and are well-meaning with this proposal, but I was wondering if we also have considered whether it might put these certain individuals in a higher tax bracket, hence paying more in income taxes and possibly change their eligibility for free and reduced lunches or even reduce a rent rate, uh, meaning in the long run, perhaps less money in their pockets. Um, I'd like to know some information about that as far as uh, how that might affect them. Uh, I believe that we do need to take a closer look at this issue, who it involves, how it would affect not only them, but the salary scale of all employees, and whether we might want to consider adding some incentives to the salary package for part-time employees. We need to look at the whole picture here, and I would suggest we take more time to look into all of these issues and concerns before we jump right into proposing $15 an hour for over 300 employees. That's all. I'll just add my thoughts, and, and I've commented on this previously. Um, one of the things that I kind of feel that 
kind of gets missed in a lot of this discussion is the fact that I think the city pays our full-time permanent workers very well. Um, and I think we have great benefits. Um, I think between our, our health insurance and IPERS, et cetera. Um, and so I think we have to look very carefully at what group of employees this is focusing on. And when, to me, when you look at literally the history um, of our economy, there have always been temporary, part-time, seasonal, oftentimes relatively low skill, entry-type entry jobs into the labor market. And those are not jobs that we look at people filling on a long-term basis who are trying to support themselves or a family. Now, not to say that there aren't some people in those jobs, but typically they are transient people. They are people who are working only seasonally and part-time, oftentimes by choice. Maybe they are students. Um, you know, maybe they're in and out of the community or whatever. But again, they tend to be in general, I would say, oftentimes relatively low skill jobs that are an opportunity for people to start developing some skills within the job market, even things of you know coming to work on time and how to be responsible and those sorts of things, and building up to that point where they develop those skills for more significant jobs with higher skills, more responsibility, et cetera. So when we talk about living wage jobs, I absolutely entirely support the fact that we are doing that and more than that with our full-time employees. But when we are looking at these part-time, seasonal, temporary positions, I, I don't agree um, in terms of the $15 an hour. I think when we look at the $900,000 to a $1 million impact on the budget and the fact that Again, our economy has, has always had these entry-level type jobs. Um, I think we need to look at this as much more modest uh, kinds of increases within this area. Mayor, can I make one, one clarification um, based on some comments? I just, I just want to clarify that we do have permanent part-time staff yes. that fall within um, either um, one of our collective bargaining units or our administrative and confidential units. So we do have part-time employees that work year-round for us that make 1752 or more. What we're talking about are the oh. hourly or sometimes referred to as, as seasonal employees. Um, they, they would generally work less than 30 hours a week, but we do have some that work 40 hours a week. However, there's limitations on how long they can be employed 40 hours per week. Um, so just want to clarify that. It's not a full-time, part-time issue. Um, uh, it is, uh, th there are part-time members of our staff that are permanent. Okay, yeah. so if I could, I haven't had a chance to speak yet. Uh, I've been trying to listen for points of agreement or potential agreement. <laughs> And, and while also thinking about some things I wanted to say. So let me express my own preliminary views first, and then let's see if we can come to some agreement about how we want to proceed. Sure. All right, so I, I, I'm completely committed to social justice for all sorts of reasons. I don't want to elaborate on that, but I'm completely committed to it. But I am very leery of increasing the minimum wage for all hourly employees to $15 a year within one or two years without having better information about possible adverse consequences and other con contextual factors that matter. So, for example, all else being equal, if we increase spending by $900,000 to $1 million to pay for the, po the proposed increase, we would have, I think this is correct, we would have to increase the city's tax levy by about 28 cents or cut something or replace something, All right? I think that 28 cents makes sense. Uh, if you were to put it all on the, on the property yeah. tax, we okay. wouldn't look to do that, but yes, that's a equivalent. Right. Also, I think it would be fiscally irresponsible of us as the council of this city to increase spending by that amount 
the $900,000 to a million dollars without first knowing what the state legislature is going to do in the spring session with regard to backfill payments. I don't know if you all know about that, but that's I am, last I knew was something like uh, would be a, a loss of about $1.5 million if that money's taken away from us. Now, Jeff, uh, please tell me if I'm Correct. making mistakes about that. So if we spend another million dollars and have a million and a half taken away, we are creating a problem. So we don't want to do that, and I don't think you would want us to do that either. We have to figure out something else to get where we, I believe, all want to go. Moreover, if we want to increase the tax levy by the 28 cents that I just mentioned, we should be conscious of the fact that there are other alternative actions that we could take that might have a bigger effect on social justice. For example, improving night and Sunday bus transit service. That's going to cost money. And OK, so what we got to do is spend it on raising the minimum wage, or are we going to spend it on improving bus transit, et cetera? Another example would be continuing to contribute to the Affordable Housing Fund. This year, we contributed $1 million to that affordable housing fund. If we're going to contribute another $1 million next year, which is a real stretch, how are we going to do that while also increasing spending on incre by increasing the minimum wage by $900,000 to a million? Also, and I think, Pauline, you mentioned this, uh, we might want to ad add additional staff to do work that we value. And, you know, that kind of stuff, those topics come up during the budget discussion, which begins officially kind of like in mid-December uh, and goes until the middle of March when by law, by state law, we have to adopt our budget. So we have to, you know, judge competing values and so on and decide what we want to spend on versus not. <laughs> Lastly, if we want to increase wages for hourly employees to $15 without in increasing taxes, we should first ask ourselves what existing services and programs we would be willing to cut. So, you know, all else being equal. So th th I believe uh, these are factors that we as a city council must consider before we immediately decide to increase the minimum wage for our hourly employees. That said, I was listening pretty carefully, and what I heard several council members say was that they would be very interested in uh, s starting with something lower than $15 an hour, effective um, um, July. July, July of 2019. 2019. Yes having an, another phase later and maybe going toward $15, $15 an hour. Okay, so then the questions become, what would be a good starting point? What would be a good stepwise increase? And are we in a position to say, commit ourselves to $15 an hour? I don't think we're in a position to commit ourselves to $15 an hour without knowing some of the, the things I just mentioned. I do think we are in a position to commit ourselves to a first phase increase. And I do think we can come up with some negotiated number there and then come up some other reasonable number for a probable second phase. But we need to know what the state's going to do with regard to backfill before we commit ourselves permanently to that. That's the way I see things anyhow. So, Jim, Jim, how do you feel I, about that three year time frame? Yes. Because I think that gives us, we, we, to me it's important that we set the target, and just like we did with Buzz Zahir's proposal on the affordable housing fund, you wanted to get that increase, we had that as a goal, we wanted to see what the backfill would do, and so we, before we went ahead with that, we wanted to make sure that was locked in. So to me, if we commit ourselves to, 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 to 15 over three and four years, or maybe we decide four, like the Board of Supervisors, um, we then commit to a quarter of that 
amount effective July 1st, 2019. Um, that gives us staff more time to do the budget analysis. The proposal would come back to us then in January of this year. Um, we'd be able to consider all the other competing proposals. And so this is our target. That's what I feel is that we just need to set the target and then it still gives us time to do our due diligence in terms of budget considerations, et cetera. Okay, so, since you asked me, I will answer. I think I'd be willing to identify $15 an hour by some date, I don't know, three or whatever, four, maybe four mm -hmm. years in the future as an ambition. And, you know, and then we, the council should revisit it as we go along. But I can accept it as an ambition, not as a permanent fixed target that we commit ourselves to. And we can't commit a future council to that, but we can have an ambition. I That's guess, yeah, I, Jim, I guess you can commit, but if, the, if we find out that's interest on the council member, we can commit. I hope we will do that. First, I want to really tell you that, yes, I'm, I'm really worried about the backfill like everyone else. You know, and I, I'm worried about transportation, affordable housing, and I know we need money for all this. And, you know, I don't want to also compare should we do tra public transportation on Sunday or should we give our employees livable way. No, we need to do all of them. I know this is need money, but guess what? If the, if the legislation in Des Moines become very good people and raise the minimum wage across the Iowa state to $15 an hour, at the same time they did the, you know, they cut the backfill. What's Iowa City gonna do? Are they gonna comply? Or are they gonna say, no, because they cut the, you know, the backfill, we cannot do this. Let us implement our value. We have a very, very good staff. We have a very good city manager. They know the budget very well than I do. I always go and take a lesson about budget so I can figure out things to tweak in and tweak out. And I figure out there is many, many ways and I guess that's why we have a city manager like Jeff and the rest of the good staff so they can figure out our values. As a council member, we have to implement our values and after that commit to it and try to figure out a way to do these kind of things. That's why I think from my, that's my own you know, thinking, I hope I get support, we should move and have a commitment on risk the, the minimum, the livable wage to $15 an hour on the next three years, and after that, just try to find, to, to do like a, com a committee maybe of three council members to sit down and figure out the ways how we can implement this. Are we gonna do this on the, like, to, also to commit the first race. Like this is, say, July of 2019 to 11 something, and after that, how we can go roll the ball down the road to do this. I hope this is how you know, the people will support this. Because I understand 100% Bolin, everyone here values social justice. I don't have any doubt you guys can, if you can do it today, the whole 15, you will do it. But don't be cautious. We have a very good like staff here. They can figure out the, you know, these kind of things, and we can tweak things. That we, as Rockney said, we just have uh, you know the, the the building permit, and we're gonna have like more revenue coming up, you know, to that. We don't have to put all this on like 20 years on like the tax. There is many, many, many other things we can do for this. Yes, we need to figure out things. And we need to do everything from public transportation to, to livable wage to all the value that we value. What do the rest of the people think here about a starting point? Uh, here, uh, let me, I'm going to propose as a starting point. Uh, but no, uh, who, who, who was it, Rockney or John, who originally provided John, a starting John. point? John. What did you suggest, John? Well, I, because of all the complexities and un unknowables at the moment um, that, you know, we could look at a couple of options to, to understand right. the financial implications. One, uh, setting a new minimum at, say, 1150 for July of 2019. Uh, and then there was some variations, you know, Moz mentioned, I think, setting it, setting it at 1150 in July of 2019. And 11, then a, a subsequent raise in January of uh, 
I don't know what you were thinking in the second. I mean, like, 20. yeah, mine is good. Yeah, I said, like, $13 an hour by $13.25, as Madison did, for the January of 2020, which is going to put us in, like, uh, 5th, uh -huh. 11 80, 75 by July 1st, and in January will be 13, 25. And after that, we, uh, the goal will be 15 in three right. years. And after that, we can see how we can do it right. for the next. So there, there are a number of variations, yes. I guess, with, you know, whether it's three, 325 in January of 2020 or 325 in July of 2020. It's, you know, it's just... With the idea, I think of we're, we're talking increments and in the, the time frame. So I, I want to see if we can get to a preliminary majority agreement on a starting point. All right. Yeah. And and then you know and then we'll kind of focus on the next part. So July 2019, 11:50 an hour. Yep. 50. I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, I was saying 11.75, but 11, if, if yeah. I find interest, I will go for it because mm -hmm. I want it to happen. Yeah. Okay, so tentatively, we're there on that. July 2019. Okay, then the next question has to do with sort of what you suggested three years. Rockney? That's correct. Maz, you wanted yes, to do this years. other thing where we had a, in, within six months, have, have another, in, uh, a different Some kind increase. of increase. Yeah. So, I would encourage us to look at this annually mm -hmm. based on what the state is doing with the backfill and what our other budget concerns are going to be. Um, and so I would recommend we go, the if we're going to do this, that we do the 1150 in July of 19. And then, I mean, we can obviously lay out tentative increases from there, but it's something I think we're going to have to look at every year with the budget in terms of that three or I'd prefer to see us look at a four-year process just in terms of mm -hmm. the effect on the budget and and maybe we'll get there faster. You know, depending upon uh, additional property tax revenue and if we keep the backfill, et cetera. Uh, I, Jim, you make, I think, I think you made a number of very good points that as a council and with responsibility to the taxpayers of this community, but still caring about that social justice, I think you made a lot of very good points. And one is we cannot commit future councils. Um, that budget is set year to year. And so I think to do that one step now for next year. I mean, you're, you're talking for the people on the low end of the scale, basically a 20% increase um, in one fell swoop, and then gradually increasing from there as we look at that budget each year with the idea of at least a three, maybe a four year step process, depending on how the budgets go to get to the 15. And I would like to do it annually, too. My only concern with July 1st is I I would just like to do an annual review with the target of the three years. I, I guess I would agree with you, Susan, that I think we should do the annual step up. But I do want us to aim for those step ups. Right. Which, which we'll do during year. our budget review. Yes. I mean, as we do our budget uh, annually. Uh, um, no, l let me get that. Really, I don't get it. And I like to understand things. Yeah. What do you mean by annually? Do you mean like, oh, we're going to increase it to 15, but next year, if it's not good, we're not going to do the raise? Like, say, now is July is 11.50, July of 2019. And when the budget comes for 20, and we find the backfill cut or something else happen, that means, oh, this year, since we are in really bad situation, we can just leave it this year and we do it next year? Are you saying that? or? I want to see a commitment, really. Yeah. Com we're going to increase uh, 1150 by July 20, you know, 2019, and we will do it like maybe 1250 on the next year, or maybe 1275, as we're going to agree to, and this kind of thing. But I really want to understand what you mean by visit it every year. What I'm if we don't it, why should we visit it? Increases would be annually would be my preference. Is yes, what I'm saying. it is annually. Yeah. I, yeah can can I, I'm unclear about whether you meant increases in on July 1st 
every year? Yes, yeah, that's what I'm right. saying. And I agree that our target should be 15 at the end of three years. That's okay. what I would like to do. So, sure. so as opposed to the increase of at January, I think we should do the increase at July 1st every year because that's the beginning uh, of okay. I agree. If we're going to do other increases, I yes. think they ought to be on July Yes, but, uh, but Susan, that's what you meant? Do you mean like increase it or because visited as if we going to review it again? That's the feeling, you know? Excuse me, my in second the language. That's fine. My, my point is, Maza, here, we cannot legally sit here today and commit future councils to specific pay increases. We are going to have to, from a legal standpoint, every year when we do the budget, uh, do that process. And hopefully the budget will allow us you know, to do those kinds of increases. But as we look at what our property tax revenues, what we want to do with transit, what we want to do with affordable housing, we will have, we just, we just legally cannot sit here and commit these future raises beyond next year. It's yes, illegal. but you are saying two things. Legally, we are not doing, or look at the budget. Look at the budget. If the budget allows us, we can do it. Or we'll legally. We'll have to set our priorities yeah, every year as we do this. This is the priorities. The priorities that we have to set today, I think, is to commit to the $15 an hour, it's like 15, uh, 11.50 on July 2019, and increase it every year annually, as uh, you know, everybody else, until we reach the goal of 15. And as the council came after two years, they don't like what we did. That's up to them. We're going to hold them accountable. But you know, I just mean we, as a council right now, we need to set a goal clearly about what we're going to do to raise I mean, the livable wage to $15 an hour starting July. How much are we going to add annually? Visit, visit the budget, but it's still that's part of the budget. But we are not going to think about, oh, maybe we don't have money. Maybe we are not going to do it. I don't want to really see that personally. Well, we're going to have to. But we can express an ambition to mm -hmm. increase by a certain amount in July 2019. Okay. But Susan's absolutely correct. We legally cannot commit whatever that council is that's in charge at that moment in time. We cannot commit them to doing that. It's in the end up to them because they're the ones that will adopt the budget. Uh, we are not talking about them. I, I understand what you think, but can we say we as a current council, we agree to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour in the next three years, it's starting July uh, of 2019, 11.50, and we increase it every year. Is that illegal? You're talking about the it, aspiration. For expressing an ambition, uh -huh. uh, it's not illegal for us to do that. Is illegal, but it's not no. commitment. I mean, it's it, like Jim's no, an ambition, but it's we we the one that who agreed at the time is not illegal for us to say that no. publicly. We did something. Okay, very anything similar else with coming up with another council? No problem. Let them. Yeah, we are not going to ask them what to do. But uh, you know, we just I would like to see a commitment for us. We don't want to talk about what's going to happen from them. We don't know them. I understand, Jeff. W what we can do uh, is. Uh, readjust the wage schedules for July 19 to 11.50 and, and figure out how we're going to compress wages. Um, generally, when we present our budget to you, with the exception of our capital projects, we just give you that one-year snapshot. It's so much data that we really don't go beyond two or three years. But as staff, we do look at some trends beyond two or three years in our operating budget. Uh, so what we can do when we revisit the budget with you in, in January is confirm that we will get to 11.50 per year direction and then show you some forecast models to, to basically say if we were to increase it $1.75 for the next two years so that you can get to 15 in three years, this is the type of money that you're looking at. And, and that way you see the data this year. And, and you can have that discussion uh, going forward this year. We, again, we typically don't show you those forecasted trends, but we can show that to you, um, and then you can you can make that. So if you want, if you want, if I'm picking up the conversation, you can um, strive or have ambition, however you want to phrase it, to get to 15 by three years. We can start to show you that forecasted data as soon as January. I think I that so. sounds so great to me. So, yeah. All right, so we we could indicate that it is our ambition. I think that's an acceptable way to put it, right? Our ambition to increase 
the minimum wage to fifteen dollars by what would that be twenty 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 one twenty twenty one July first twenty twenty one. Can you are really confused? I don't know what you mean by ambition. Wait, wait, I, I wouldn't understand that word because I'm really, is this like a commitment or this is maybe, what, what do you mean by ambition? Can you explain that For to me? For the reasons I indicated, I personally will not commit us to tw uh, paying $15 an hour by, that, by July 1, 2021 without having better, better knowledge about what the state backfill payment will be, without having better sense of uh, alternative costs that are and expenses that we will want to make and how those play out in our budget. I need to know that kind of thing before I will make the kind of firm decision you want from me. That, that's true. And for me, I don't like ambition, really. <laughs> yeah. That, that's for me, you said that, and I, I really don't agree with you. I'm glad that I asked about the word ambition because I really don't know what that means. But it would really take a subsequent, the way it is works is that you're right about in terms of future councils could change, but if we commit to this, it would take a future set of four that would have to change direction to staff. So they would have to make that political decision exactly. in, from the future. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're getting what we want, Yes. which is the commitment and then understanding that if a future council wants to deviate and say we they want to depart and we don't want to do the 15, they would make that political choice. Mm -hmm. I agree 100% with Rodney. So I've expressed a, a phraseology here, a way of yeah. phrasing this. That I think we agree. We would have um, to indicate to the staff that we have um, the ambition of moving to uh, $15 an hour effective July 1st, 2021. And so you're going to give us some data when we get, get into our budget process later this year that will help us see that as it, you know, see how it plays out financially. And and then there's in the background there's this caveat that Washington just happen. laid out. Yep. So how does that sound to the five of you? Sounds like a plan to me. And uh, I guess we just gonna wait for Jeff to come and give us like some ideas if uh, someone like budget work or this is could be no, also. No, no, no. I, I, I've just said what we're saying is we are telling the staff we have an ambition of moving to $15 an hour effective July 1st, 2021. We are going to prepare as staff to get to $15 in three years. Uh -huh. And along the way, we're going to show you the numbers. And if you get uncomfortable with it, but when looking at the numbers, you can give us direction to pull back. But we are going to move forward and get to the 15 by three years based on what we're, based on what I'm hearing Good. Yeah. yeah, that's what I I'd rather do four years, but I mean, you're talking 1150 in 2019, mm -hmm. 1325 uh, in 2021, and $15. If you do it in equal splits, you're talking a buck 75 an hour um, yeah. per year. I'd rather see it looked at over four years in terms of the budget impact. I think four years is too much because IO policy project estimated that is 14.29. It's affecting 2018. We are way behind from the actual number. Three years, I guess, is it's good. It's good. How about the rest of you? Do you have a preference about three years or four years? I don't just personally know that it makes that much difference. I mean, I, I feel we're into, uh, you know, predicting futures, which we cannot accurately predict. And uh, it's a very volatile time. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to stay with three, with, but I think we need to be fully aware of the unpredictability that we're dealing with, uh, both within our own local economy and the national and world economy. But, um, yeah. So as I think as, as long as we understand that, you know, uh, Yeah, we understand that. And we can make everything happen, yeah, we will. Okay, so I think I see, what, yes. five people, and maybe, I don't know, Susan, uh, who would be okay with three years, but you prefer four, four. I understand yep. that. Okay, so I, th I think we're clear about where how we want to move ahead. Okay. It's 17 till we don't really have time to move into clarification of agenda items and that kind of thing. 
<laughs> is there, well, it, it, we have two minutes, three minutes. It, are there any s individual items that you really strongly uh, need clarified with regard to the, uh, to the agenda? Yeah, uh, yes. Not the, no, no, no. I mean like the IBs, not now. No, I, I don't have anything. Does, does anybody? I'm trying to look at my own notes to figure out if I do. Yeah. Mm. Oh, with regard to proclamations during the meeting, we have five proclamations. I'd like to divvy them up. So. I'll do one. <laughs> so I'm just going to pass them out at random, if that's all right with you. And I'll do the last one, which is play, play evolution. It's kind of fun. All right, so there's that. Uh, anything else? Uh, yeah, we didn't have a chance to get into the climate action, so we'll do that during the formal meeting. Okay, I, I think we'll have to stop there. Okay with you all? We'll, we'll reconvene the work session after the formal meeting. So we really did not have an opportunity to go through questions about agenda items. I don't know that there's a need to do that, but if anybody has any questions they need to ask, any follow-up questions, anything like that. No, I, I just want to thank staff as usual for the response to a lot of the correspondence. I think staff does a fantastic job of, um, I guess if I only had one comment, Jeff offload some of that to somebody else. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, well. <laughs> I know, so probably like sometimes advice. you feel like it's quicker to do it yourself and send it to somebody else, but still, just would encourage that. Um. <laughs> just forward to Ashley. Yeah. Forward yeah. to Simon. Simon's <laughs> like, no. It's no. Simon. Um, yeah, Ashley's done with the senior center. Ashley's the, done with the climate action all committee. Time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, plenty of time. Yeah. Plenty the, of time. the only comment, the only follow up comment I would make, I was going to make it when Mazahir was talking about the goats. Was it goats? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that individual, one, the city may not want to grant the exemption. The second comment I would make is a very large coyote has returned to that area. So they might want to be really careful with if if we were even to allow that. Um, it was in my backyard today. Okay. <gasps> I mean, we, we have a 55-pound dog that is getting older, and my husband went out to make sure to get the dog because the coyote was following the dog to the house. Oh, my so. gosh. I saw a fox on 7th the other day. So. Oh, we saw a fox out there today, too, but the, a large coyote is back. So. Oh, really? Well, wolves are next. In, yes. our, in our neighborhood, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, I'm assuming there are no other questions about oh. agenda items. Okay, let's move to the information packet discussion, September 6th. Thanks for the email, Jeff, to Manville Heights neighbors, and that links to uh, Rockney's suggestions with regard to the work session. We can come to that in a minute. So, questions about the September 6th packet? Or comments about it? Okay, moving on, September 13th. Yes, I do have for September 13th. Um, I really would like to talk to you about IB 9 through 13, but I'm gonna lay them down in like three sections. First one, like item 9 to 13, is all of them related to serving like people of color. This is done out in IB9, uh, because it's saying in June of 2018, the police department began monthly supervisor review of DMC uh, states. This is done also in IB11, regarding use of the equity review toolkit. A new grant management police require a racial minority impact statement. My question will be, since those have been stated, like in one way, I would like to see a full description of this process and current implementation. What else, you know, I... 
of the supervisor re reviews that are taking place? Uh, I don't, actually, I, I, please, I, in general. Ma, 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 please talk into the microphone so oh, for not. recording purposes. Okay, again, um, that's not the question I told okay. you. Okay. Uh, for, I guess I'm talking about if you look at IB 9 to 13, you will find out that all of them related to serving people of color. And I'm gonna just like tell you why I said that, because in IP9, in June 2010, says the police department began monthly supervision for DMC, which is like a disproportionate minority contact. This means people of color. And again, in IB11, regarding use of equity review toolkit, a new ground management police require a racial minority impact statement. You know, all this like dealing with, but I really would like to see a full description of the process of current implementation toward those things, like what you guys have done or. Okay, I'm not, I'm not tracking exactly. What, where are you looking at on IP11? What, what? Yes, if you read all of them from, not only 11, I mean like all of them from nine to 13, they talking about like, you know, the people of color. Okay, so just the toolkit process in general, yes. mm -hmm. and then the police strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Implementation plan, yeah. Uh, maybe not now, I don't mean that. You know, I just mean like if you can bring us like a short summary versions of what the implementations. Yeah, I guess I'm not tracking you either, Maz, but because I think all three of these reports are designed to be reports on actions that are being taken or have been taken. But it so, doesn't have really full, it just say like we did this, but it doesn't have like really the full description of the process. Yeah, that, at least the way that I, when I read them, it doesn't tell me. And I would like to see that. I, I guess I'm not tracking either, because I, I- Have you I, read I, all of them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I read them and I just really don't think it, it cleared. To me, I mean, if, if to me, if I start with IP nine, um, to me, that's pretty direct about what they've been doing, what their goals are, the updates in terms of additional training, uh, what the training is on, um, participation in various events. I, I mean, if, if you just take one at a time, like IP9, what, what would you want different or more than what Chief Matherly has given us in IP9? I just want to like really understand the, you know, how the actual process is when they do this kind of things and yeah. So sort of like more detail on mm -hmm. each individual red-lined event? Yes. Yeah, that, that's asking for a lot, Mom. Yeah, I agree. I, um, so, but, I, but I hear what lot. you're saying. What do you mean by asking a lot? Hmm? When you ask, you ask. You know, if they can do it, they, they can do it. Well, but they're given, I mean, I understand your, your part of it is, um, you, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you can't understand the detail of what's being described in the memos because there's, I don't know, all sorts of background knowledge assumed by the, the pre people who wrote these uh, reports. But if they go into more detail, we'll have regular reports that are much longer. And I don't, I don't know that we want that. And they're already, some of them are already fairly long. Well, we could do a couple things. One, um, we could set up an individual meeting with you and Chief Matherly and, and you and Stephanie, and they can go in more detail with you and take an hour or two and go through that. That might be helpful for you. And then if there's something that's concerning that you hear in those meetings or that you think needs to be uh, brought forward to the full council, you can certainly um, talk to the council about that. Um, the other option would be to have them come before the entire council in, in a work session and um, go yeah, through Yeah, I these asked points. about that, but it, it doesn't happen. That's why I'm saying this. I asked last time, and this is, will be in IB 10. And the question that I'm gonna, maybe you can respond to it. 
Anyway, I can I can go with that. Whatever you think, if the council are not interesting on doing this, I will be more interested to sit down with him and maybe uh, Stephanie, as you recommend, and just review those. Yeah. I, I, think that might, I think that might be a good way. I, I guess I would just say, I don't think it's that we're not interested. Oh. I, I think yeah. it, maybe it's with you being newer to council, you don't have the, quite the same background, just not having been on council as long. Maybe. Um, so that may just be part of it. And so that might be a good way for you to get more of that background. That no, no, and I like Jeff's helpful. idea. If you meet with chief and there's parts that you don't think you should bring to the council as a whole, I think we'd all consider that. Right. Yeah, yeah for sure. If, if they can do better. Yeah, I, I, I really yeah. agree for that. No problem. That's answer my question. You're definitely right that they all have to do with people of color. They all have to do with racial equity. Mm -hmm. And quite intentionally, I mean, each of these are initiatives that we started. I'm not, I mean, the prior council started the... Um, uh, the, the DMC committee, the support yeah, the, committee. The, yeah, yeah that, that part of it. Uh, the, and then Stephanie's um, regular reports, that's a consequence of stuff that happened mm -hmm. under the prior council. And the, re the equity review toolkit is something that really Kingsley pushed for very hard and, you know, we agreed that mm -hmm. needed to be done and, yeah, uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that yeah. will work it out for me. And IB10, it seemed to address changes in the past practice that were causing over, uh, over patrolling in minority area and resulting in this disproportionate traffic stop. I understand, by the way, I really gonna shout out the good work that our current chief doing to really reduce this. And I, uh, I been here like when he was not here, and I been I I see the difference now. Uh, he, there is many many like we have we improve a lot. The progress is really has been made, you know, and but still we have work to do. That's why I guess I want the city manager or if he was here to come in on this, you know, because last time I asked the same question and I, they said he will be here. And I guess he was here. If we had done this during the yeah, work been. session, he would have answered the question. But if Jeff can answer, it will be good. Otherwise, we can wait for him again. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just really try to concisely walk you through the memo. So the, the uh, I'm starting on page 29 of the IP, which is um, IP 10. The uh, first table is from Dr. Barnum's report. So Dr. Barnum organizes his data by square miles in the city, and we have 50-some square miles, 52 maybe square miles. And the, th the zones that you see highlighted there are the ones that have the highest frequency of traffic stops. So Dr. Barnum's, one, focused on traffic stops, and then two, collects data on, on a much smaller level than, than um, we patrol. So those areas, 13, 21, 28, 29, and 30, then correspond uh, to, I guess, the data supporting those is, is the next table there. You saw that in Dr. Barnum's presentation. We patrol differently than that. We don't sign an officer to each square mile. We only have six to 10 to 12 officers out there at any given time, depending on the time of day. So they're assigned to one of four areas, and you see that in table three. There's green, blue, and a couple of pinkish colors there. Um, we allocate those resources, how many officers to each of those zones, um, differently based on time of day and um, the calls for service and, and uh, experience that we have. So downtown is the smallest beat there, but that's where we put the most of our police presence down there. Our experience tells us that's where uh, we need to be to um, be close to where the calls for service are because there's high levels of accidents, there's high levels of uh, OWIs and other, and other incidents. So the police uses data to, to distribute their staffing like that. Um, what I think you, you get into with the, chief, the, the new information that you're seeing on tables four, five, six, and four, mm -hmm. five, and six is that's some of the data that we look at to help deploy those resources. And when we're talking about traffic stops, um, we're really talking about those times in which our officers are not running from call to call to call. Because there's a lot of times during the week where our officers aren't really proactively patrolling. They're just going from call to call to call. But in those times that they're not, um, they're going to deploy um, in, in different uh, areas uh, and sometimes based on their experience. So if they're doing more of a traffic um, 
uh, an, a traffic kind of beat um, or detail. Thank you. Um, they're going to they're going to naturally go where there's the most crashes. So if you look at Table Six, for example, you have the most crashes in those areas that Dr. Barnum highlighted, and that's what the chief was trying to convey there. You know, you have Zone um, 13, which is the north side. Uh, um, well, all of them there except really the Miller Orchard and the Friendship Zone. Those are the top five, um, the top five areas for Dr. Barnum's report. So I think what the chief was trying to convey is um, we're, we're not um, doing the hot spot policing, and that was a conversation years ago where we were flooding neighborhoods, and not just not just on traffic detail, but flooding neighborhoods because they might have had a a couple of serious crimes, maybe a, a murder or lots of vehicle uh, burglaries or something like that. We're not we're not doing that anymore, but we still use data to deploy where we're going. And our experience tells us, particularly when we're looking at traffic stops and doing proactive traffic activity, that there's certain parts of town uh, that we should be in to help prevent um, accidents from occurring. You know, I, I understand, you know, your explanation, but it's really when I ask that a question to Dr. Barnas, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, he he really said that, yeah, it, it, it felt, uh, it seemed to him that the police is spending more time on southeast Iowa City, which is the, you know, the the map was showing, and he said, yeah. And I said, uh, I, maybe you cannot answer that question. This question will be for the department. I remember, uh, I think Captain Jerry was here or somebody, I, if I remember, and he was telling me that because there is more traffic over there. And I was like telling him, really, how come the traffic's only on that side? You're telling me there is no more traffic in like Scott Boulevard or, you know, Dutch or North Dutch or something like that. And uh, we, we end up, we, we, we supposed to meet, for, you know, wait for the police chief to come and explain this to us. And now also the data saying that the crash, uh, because there is many crash over there, call for service. I guess the, the question will be if this is really because there is many crash there. Why there is many crash over there? What's wrong over there in the streets that okay. making the people like having like many, many crash there? I guess we need to solve the problem. If, because due to the crash, people are not on the city knowing that. They know who's lived there. And uh, if our, our, our office are doing everything as it should be, let us tell the public that. Let us solve the problem that making the police stop more minority on that area. I would love if the, if you know, the police chief can explain this to us like more, like well, focus on this. Correct me if I'm wrong though too, Jeff, Officer Schwint is leading the way on data-driven justice initiatives. And I think as I understand what the department's effort is, is it's to use rational, strategic, empirical-based <coughs> decisions rather than irrational ones. And unfortunately, the data seems to have sussed out the irrational um, things that they were focusing on, like for example, consent searches right. that very clearly demonstrate demonstrated that requests for consent for search were not yielding more accurate law enforcement information, and so they were able to, I think, modify that. So I'm comfortable, especially with what Officer Schwent is doing, and I think he's sort of leading the way nationally on this with the DOG grant to sort of see how they're going. And Jim, you had mentioned Kingsley. Um, shout out to Kingsley. I bet he's not watching, but I'll shout out anyway. Um, he seemed to be very, he led the way in the DMC committee, and he seemed to think that we were moving in the right direction, but as always, and I'm sure Chief Matherly would, would admit we can always certainly advance and accelerate and do better and always strive to do better. Yeah, and I want to make that clear. You know, the, the, the data that Dr. Barnum presented, we're not, we're not satisfied with that data. We know we have a ways to go. Um, okay. But we, we don't feel it's, it's because of the patrol allocation. Okay. We don't think that that's the, the driver mm -hmm. uh, of it. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's more just... Um, you know, there's there's all the things that's laid out in his memo. It's it's training the police force. It's making sure that we're aware of our um, implicit biases. It's um, using discretion on what needs a traffic stop, what needs a traffic violation, and adjusting some of those norms. Um, I, I don't think it's patrol allocation, but going through an exercise like this and breaking down that data is certainly helpful. Yes. Yeah. Um. 
Okay, okay. other items on that? Uh, the last item, packet? last item is not like question really, it's just a common, an IB13. Uh, diversity offered by non-profit fund, uh, funded by the city, like for reaching diverse population in, I know that is really challenge. I want us to continue to try to do better in including diverse population in the programs and activities of the culture art, in entertainment and educational organization funded by the city. Uh, you know, I know it's killing, but we still would like to push on that, to reach out to like various community so they can be part of this. We have it there and we approve it, we believe on it, but how we can just advertise it more so can, people can know about it. Uh, I couldn't agree more and I can tell you in, in every one of those organizations, at least the ones I have routine contact with, mm -hmm. uh, I emphasize this point all great. the time. Great, great, yeah, yes. Every one of us can do that, it would be great. That's okay, all I uh, have. Other items? Um, IP3 work session agenda and my IP7. Yep. Uh, so just wanted to give a little brief background in terms of the level of, of, of sort of uh, review that I'm looking for here. Uh, as we may recall, uh, relatively recently, I had requested authorization for a subsequent work session relating to what had happened at the Kinnick House, not retrospective, but prospectively, to evaluate future tools that would not only be used in Manville Heights neighborhood, but potentially could uh, uh, affect the city as a whole in various residential neighborhoods. Um, I'm not viewing the items that I list in IP7. I don't want final ordinance proposals. Really, what I all I was really looking for is essentially a, a staff memo to sort of outline for the upcoming work session, which I don't know if we've actually said. I'm assuming it would take place in like December or January, something along those lines. Essentially, just essentially like a regular routine staff memo uh, so that we can have a focused discussion. I mean, staff may say certain of these proposals just sort of categorically we're not able to do, they're not feasible, we should look into it further. Um, but that's really what I was looking for. And I, I think in, um, this originally uh, was an email that I'd sent to Jeff, and I think I had more items. And I, so I think Jeff wanted a little bit of narrowing down. So for these items, IP 7, 1 through 3, um, they're all sort of things that I think we had discussed at our original work session on Kinnick to some degree of generality. And as I see the consensus that emerges, the, the least the Manville Heights neighborhood and probably other areas throughout the city don't necessarily want a heavy regulatory footprint, but they want to evaluate for these large sort of atypical structures some additional tool to give staff and the public an earlier opportunity to weigh in and to give staff the tools, the regulatory tools, to allow that denial. Because I think what we had happened before is no one saw the possibility of something like this being developed. And who would have foreseen an urban planning conference on whether a Kinnick House would be in a neighborhood? Um, so that's really all I'm looking for, is essentially just a, a, a memo outlining uh, sort of a general staff response to this. And then once we'd have the work session, it would be similar to what we had done when we had talked about you know, unrelated occupancy, that if, that if some of them sort of made it way through, then we'd say, hey, could staff propose a, a more particular uh, solution to this? Because I don't think there's going to be immediate structures of this magnitude or of this kind in the foreseeable future. Um, but I don't see it as, uh, I see it as a possibility that there could be others throughout the community as well. Um, so that's really what I'm looking for. Um, and so Jeff had talked about the need to get additional support. So I'm just wondering whether we would have support to at least get a staff memo in response to that. I think clarity about expectations is good. Uh, I don't have any problem with uh, what you've suggested uh, be discussed. I think having a staff memo on those topics would be appropriate. I think we've already addressed a couple of them, and we would see that in a memo we get from the staff. But We'll, we'll get, we don't need to talk about it now, but, yeah. but you know, we'll get okay. to that point when we get to it. I guess what more, what I was hoping for is, is that we get all the issues out on the table so we can 
fully address all the questions that you have whenever this work session takes place. That's why I wanted you know, to send Rockney's comments to a conversation like this, because if, if, if others have similar topics they want us to research or comment on, just assume get them out now and, and try to have a fully vetted conversation in December or January. The additional one that I would have, and this is one we've kind of talked about before, but haven't gotten into into specifics, is the idea of somebody being able to buy, say, two adjacent lots and tear down the buildings and then put up some kind of a mega structure that yeah, is not. That's really what they're. It, which, which kind of, which, which kind of gets for, to what you're saying yeah. here that it's kind of out of scale with yeah. what's already there in the neighborhood. Yes. Um, but depending upon the underlying zoning, it it Maybe may it may it may yeah. be it may not just be residential. It didn't didn't so. we do didn't we address that in that set of um, amendments that we made back when we were doing the rental cap? I, I thought that topic was addressed. Uh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think, think so. so. All right, okay, so. y'all would know. There are other things in that rental cap that we did change that affected some which, like this, which event. I think could yeah. be part of this discussion. Right. It's just refreshing ourselves on what. <clears throat> what additional Setbacks constraints are, are in place. Yeah. But as I recall, I too felt there were some gaps in that in terms of building, potential building envelope that not only for a kind of a Kinnick house, but you know, with the lifting of the rental cap, you could have a very large house uh, because of higher occupancy, mm -hmm. uh, which may also be out of scale mm -hmm. uh, with the neighborhood. So, you know, having some building envelope controls building on what we already did through the rental cap to begin to look at that. Okay, that we can address that. Yeah, yeah. all right. Okay. okay. Uh, IP8 is the city council salary and benefits material, uh, and there's a September 10th memo from Jeff. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we have the, the wherewithal to address this tonight, uh, but I, I'll say a few things kind of right at the start. The table that Jeff provided us concerning the, what is it, 12 other cities in Iowa, I think it reveals pretty clearly that there's ample justification for increasing the salaries of Iowa City's city council members, especially if we want to make it more feasible for more people to consider serving, especially people who are not already, don't already have the financial wherewithal to mm -hmm. kind of uh, do this kind of thing. <clears throat> so. I have some suggestions. I guess I can just, on. I'm on a roll here, I'll go with it. Um, when I looked at the, the memo and the information contained in it, I thought, okay, well, the two strong mayor cities are outliers. They're just different. Mm -hmm. So let's ignore them. And I thought North Liberty is different. No insult intended here, but their salaries are uh, really tiny. So, okay, throw it out. When I do that, I end up with the... Um, the city council members have, uh, for the remaining nine cities having a, a, an average salary of $12,300 roughly per year with a range between 4700 to 26000 All right, so the key number there is 12300 Mayors, on the other hand, had an average of about 22400 And again, there was a substantial range of difference. And then I started thinking about our discussion earlier this evening concerning minimum wage for our hourly employees. And I started thinking, well, okay, well, if, what if we use that as a rubric for generating ideas about salaries for council members and the mayor? So if we assume that count this, I'm going to make some assumptions. People can dis disagree with the assumptions if they want. If we assume that a council member works an average of 20 hours per week, and if we use the $11.50 per hour figure we came up with for the first year for the minimum wage increase, then council members would earn, I have to, my math's a little off here, council members would earn, I don't know, $12,000 or something like that per year, maybe eleven five. I'm not, not sure, because I, I did it for $12 an hour instead of $11.50. So that's what I'd like to suggest, that we use that as a marker. My original idea was to double the salaries 
of council members and the mayor. But in this case, I think, okay, let's tie it to that minimum wage increase. 12 sounds reasonable to me, but I think we should have like a 15 minute work session to further flesh it out. Um, what do people think about that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. As opposed to spur of the moment. Yeah, I think we're tired and I'm just giving you some But I think that's a, certainly food for thought and I think we can project that then to the public then when we do the... But I think in addition to the salary, we I think we, you know, we should benefits. talk about the uh, insurance yeah. and the city yeah, kicking so in for that because we were the only city like that it. they don't kick in. Yeah, so a key question so. there basically would be whether to assume a council member's half time or right. s some other figure. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, my own suggestion is th that we use that minimum wage as an indicator, 20 hours per week half and time. half time. Mm -hmm. well, I'll mean, just say that Sioux City kind of jumped out at me. I, I kind of liked what Sioux City, had, its format um, or salary structure. It's The other issue I was thinking about was city size. Uh, and Sioux City is roughly the same size as Iowa City. And then the question of the health care insurance, I think, is really important. Yeah, too. sure it is. And, you know, if somebody signs up for health care, that, that, a lot of that would come out of the salary for that particular council member. Okay. So we need to have this on a future work session. Probably sooner the better, sure. and if it's only 15 minutes, that'd be great. All right, anything else on that information packet? Um, I was looking through uh, IP11, um, and one of the things it mentions is uh, it bike racks for multifamily um, housing units. Um, and that would be very useful for lower income individuals, students, and so on. Okay. Um, and I was wondering what type of steps would be kind of necessary to move forward with something like that. Well, the, the what we were looking at there is um, one of two options, um, either through regulation, retro, the retro making requirements uh, for existing buildings to provide bike racks, which wouldn't be a very popular regulation to pass. You're essentially um, requiring them to, to come up to current code, but that would require them to go out, purchase, and install the, the bike racks. The other option would be for the city to um, incentivize it ourselves so that we would buy the racks or we would use older racks that we have and we would target certain facilities or certain apartments um, and, and basically ask if they'd like to participate in a program where we gave them a bike rack and either help them install it or, or allow them to install it. So it's kind of on the back burner for, for staff right now, it's just um, but it's it's still on our radar. Quite frankly, if we decide to move forward with it, I have no problem personally with putting it on their dime given the tax breaks that they're getting from the state. I mean, they're going from being taxed at 100% of their value down to probably 55% of their value based on the rollback for residential. So, you know, given how much money they're going to be saving in property taxes, I personally don't have a problem with giving them 12 to 24 months to come into compliance with our current code on their own dime. Okay, anything else in that information packet? I'll just mention it was uh, kind of, I found it interesting on IP15, the uh, restoring civil society with, you know, as a focus on libraries. Mm -hmm. But I thought I had come, come up, or at least I hadn't run across the phrase uh, social infrastructure. And uh, I mentioned it, you know, on our one of our rezonings, and and here it is being used again. <laughs> Wait a minute! I thought I came. He up quoted with it. you, John. <laughs> yeah, he quoted. He heard, he heard our our meeting, I guess. Um, but yeah, he defined it as social spaces and organizations that shape the way people interact, and it is a very important aspect of um, the the physical landscape. Okay. Let's move on to the last item, which is council updates on assigned boards, commissions, and committees. So, Maz, could we start with you and move to the left? Uh, I haven't done anything since last meeting, yeah? Okay. Every three months. 
I'm, I'm going to ask Ashley to step in here. Um, so could you speak a little bit, Ashley, about the Iowa League of Cities, about the, uh, the Metro Coalition, and about the meeting with the Ames mayor and council member? Sure. Um, so I had the opportunity last week to attend the Iowa League of Cities uh, conference. So it's a collection of city administrators and elected officials. And um, during that meeting, the first day, uh, we met with the Metro Coalition, so the group of 10 largest cities in Iowa. And um, there was a variety of discussions, uh, first about legislative status, um, predictions for the upcoming elections, um, and what kind of impacts that could have on, on our cities. Um, they followed that with some discussion of particular legislative issues, so some of it was pertaining to water quality issues, but also about the backfill as, and continued conversations about that. It was a nice opportunity to, to get a feel for and, and meet with other um, larger communities and, and the elected officials that are leading them. Um, so as part of that, the next day I met with and talked with the mayor from the city of Ames and a council member there, uh, Councilor Martin, and they had particular interest in our approach to the occupancy code and regulation changes that we made earlier last year. And um, it seems like Ames take, took a very similar approach. A lot of what they've done with their code changes, which just recently took place, um, mirror what we have done here uh, as an approach to the occupancy issues. They do have a um, like an exception and waiver program for um, people who would take exception to their program. Um, that's currently going on. Um, they were interested in, in some of the other things that we are doing, particularly the university program. They hadn't heard about it, and so they've asked for more information about um, turning our rental properties into single family homes. Um, so we've provided them information about that, and then they also took interest in our climate action plan. So um, they're interested there and already looking to us as an example. Uh, for what they can do as well. So um, that's what I took from that event and happy to answer other questions. So. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Okay. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Susan. Um, given that the Access Center has meetings three times a month, <laughs> two, two, two executive committee meetings and one steering committee meeting, I usually have an update. Um, we continue to move forward. Um, I think I don't have a whole lot more than what Matt Miller presented at our at our work session tonight. Other than um, we are going to have a, a staff meeting and myself, uh, city manager's office, city attorney's office, and police department, and myself, just to kind of talk through what we might want to see in terms of a 28E agreement between the city of Iowa City and the county um, in exchange for putting in our money towards the building, um, what kind of services we expect, kind of metrics that we might want to have tied into that, um, and if the thing didn't work, how we would get our money back. So we're just going to start looking at some of the details um, that we would want to have in that 28E agreement. So that's it. John? Nothing. Rockney? Iowa City of Literature has a lot of good stuff coming up. Uh, most importantly, the Iowa City Book Festival, October 1st through October 7th. And if everyone couldn't tell already, I'm sort of a nerd. I love to read and I love books. Um, and I used to always watch C-SPAN and they'd always have these really good books and then these really good authors. And I often thought, gosh, why doesn't Iowa City have those sorts of events? You know, where you have these good readings and good discussions. Well, we do. We do. <laughs> and we used to have it during the summertime, but now we actually have it during a time when people can go when they're all not hot and sweaty. So go to the iowacityofliterature.org website, and the event itself is from October 1st through October 8th. There should be a lot of good authors that are there. There's one um, great book that they're talking about with, uh, you know, What Happened to Wisconsin, which is a good book that I want to read, and um, a lot of good stuff. So check that out. Secondly, for you family members out there, if you have any kids that are interested in writing, another great program that John Kenyon has implemented is called One Book, Two Book. 
And it allows kids, I don't know what the actual age range is, I want to say it's 8 to 12 or something like that, but they can do uh, submissions. And then if they get selected, they get to read their book public or their, their little writing publicly. Um, I think it's this spring, maybe like February, March time frame is when it usually is. But they're taking submissions now. So if you have aspiring you know, writer out there in the family, do check out that website and submit that for one book, two book. But other than that, that is it. First meeting, we had 20 members on our board, so we have plenty of board members. Well, I have a couple of things to mention. The, the Convention and Visitors Bureau board meeting is going to take place on the 20th, and Pauline and I are going to be meeting with Janet Godwin and Paul Rossler, the new vice president of the school board, on October the 3rd. And I'm still waiting to hear from Mayor John Lundell about meeting with Mayor Terry Donahue. We're kind of waiting on Terry. <laughs> So that's it for me. Could I mention one other thing I sure. forgot? Um, I'm going to be out of town, but the cyclocross is not this coming weekend, but next weekend. I, starting Thursday or Friday, I'm not sure. Do you know, Jeff? Friday, I believe, Friday. 28th through the So 30th. Friday through Sunday. So, you know, that's going to be back for year number four, three. I forget. Yeah, yeah three, number, number three. So great. Um, International riders, it's it's a very different kind of event than what you typically think about in terms of bicycling. This is like obstacle course with your bicycle um, down at the Johnson County Fairgrounds. So would encourage people to come out and they're probably also still looking for volunteers. <laughs> and also I forget to say kids vendor farmers market on Saturday. Please come out and encourage the kids to continue participating in those kind of events. Yeah. Good deal. Okay. I think we're done for the night. Thank you, everybody.